As the war came to an end, nations became set on developing light tanks that could efficiently combat enemy troops. It seemed logical, as they were easier to produce with less resources, so more could be deployed. The Soviet solution to this was the BT tank, which at the time was the most mobile tank in the world. Traveling at an unprecedented speed of over 44 miles per hour, which was fast for the time, along with an easy to repair body, it seemed like this was the future of armored vehicles. Yet, it was with the Spanish Civil War in 1936 that the world started to see how light tanks may not be the most optimal fighting vehicle. As the world developed more and more tanks, it was only natural that more tanks would find others like them in battle. The better armored vehicles were much more likely to win, as they could take the hits and continue to deal damage for much longer. Even though they were more costly to make, heavy, durable tanks needed to become the norm. Heavy tanks weren't always an option for some nations, however. After World War I, Germany was unsurprisingly weakened, and development of tanks became the product of secrecy as not to attract Allied powers' attention. Smaller vehicles went into development under code names. In 1934, the Panzer I entered mass production. It was a light tank that was poorly armed, and it made its debut in the Spanish Civil War as Hitler assisted the Franco nationalists. The Panzer I was built for the purposes of training, yet it still found its way into combat, and it was as good as anything built for training would be. Thinly armored and poorly armed, the only thing it had on its side was its modest speed of over 30 miles per hour. Compared to its counterparts of the Civil War, it only seemed to excel in its distance before refueling, but that doesn't help a lot when you can be turned into dust once the enemy spots you. The Soviet attempts at a light tank were much more well off than the Germans, as the T-26 had dominated the Spanish Civil War, and had continued use up until the end of World War II. It was the most produced tank of the interwar period, with 11,000 models over its lifetime. While it was not comparable to tanks designed and deployed closer to World War II, it still saw a massive amount of conflict as it was so readily available and reliable. Even when Germany invaded the Soviet Union a decade after its creation, it was still the primary vehicle in the Soviet defense. The general design was kept throughout the 30s and a stream of variants were made, sustaining its practicality even further. One of, if not the most influential tank of the time, was the Vickers 6 ton. It was the basis for the aforementioned T-26, and its design was altered to fit specific needs throughout the interwar period. Surprisingly, it wasn't used in its home country's military, as the UK only purchased four and they were used for training only. But don't think I forgot about France. France was not to be left out, and developed the Renault R35. It suffered from a poor suspension system, and it was replaced by the Renault R40. The Renault R35 functioned as a successor to the World War I tank, the Renault FT. The FT was the French primary tank of World War I near the end of the war, and the first to have a rotating turret. It actually saw continued use into World War II and beyond. The Renault FT started its life in 1917, and continued its service until 1949. Yeah, that's right. This tank, even with all the advancements of World War II, continued its relevance almost until the 1950s. It was used late in World War I by France, but its best known use is for its massive production run and use in 27 countries. A little over 7 tons, it is certainly small, even for a light tank. As stated before, this tank was the first to use a rotating turret and this revolutionized tank design. For the first time, the gunner could easily spot and fight the enemy without requiring them to get a driver to move the tank itself. This would go on to influence nearly all future tank designs, creating a standard that is still in use today. The only drawbacks came from its short range of under 40 miles and its slow speed, but those are small prices to pay for the innovations this tank brought. By 1928, Japan had developed the Type 89 Igo, lovely name by the way, to function as a light tank and it was commonly used in the Second Sino-Japanese War in the early 1930s. By this point, the tank saw major additions, adding about 10 tons of weight, making it lose its light tank status. Its specifications were close to that of a World War I tank, with a top speed of 16 miles an hour. It would be used during World War II, but not often, as it was far too dated in design and specifications. Throughout the interwar period, Japan would introduce the Type 94 tankettes, which was insanely light, even for a tank, at under four tons. These very light tankettes could be destroyed with relative ease by a machine gun from a decent distance away, making them incredibly impractical during World War II and restricting their use to the 1930s. Most commonly used in the Japanese army at the time was the Type 95 Hago, which featured an innovative diesel engine. It brought specs that would make it suited for combat during World War II, but it still wasn't designed to go against tanks. It was still very light by standards for the time, at just over 8 tons, and brought a small turret cabin that would make it rather unpleasant to use. And finally, we have the good old US of A which was not very interested in tank development. 
Oh, what a time. Several prototypes were made in the nation during World War I, but they're all pretty strange and risky designs. None were ever used in battle, and the nation instead opted to buying and using French and British tanks during World War I. America continued its tank apathy well throughout the interwar period, and throughout the period America created even more designs, none of which ever saw battle. It wouldn't be until World War II when America would begin deploying its own tanks. But that is a story for another time. What do you want me to cover in a future video? Say in the comments, this is Cody of Knowledge Hub.